OK, the next item of business is a debate on motion 13602 in the name of Shona Robeson on Scotland Government Priorities, investing in Scotland's public services. I'd invite members uh, wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Shona Robeson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, allowed 11 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me firstly uh, move the motion in my name. Investing in our public services to ensure that they are effective and sustainable is central to delivering the Scottish Government's priorities of eradicating child poverty, growing our economy and tackling the climate emergency. However, our ability to deliver this is choked by austerity, Brexit and the cost of living crisis. The simple ABC of Westminster holding Scotland back. For the last 14 years, we have endured Westminster austerity, which has been an impediment to the delivery of effective public services by curtailing investment in our frontline services. We have seen Brexit forced on the people of Scotland expressly against their democratic will. And of course, Brexit has uh, taken the legs out from under economic growth, meaning we must work even harder to help Scotland's economy with the powers that we have meaning business and our vital public services must work harder to fill vacancies and supplement local skills. And the cost of living crisis, which has been created by the, the Tories and, of course, exacerbated by Liz Truss, with those on the Tory benches, of course, demanding that we followed her budget, and not content with that damage, the Conservatives' current spending plans will see nearly £20 billion of cuts and they want to go further in their manifesto. They've got another £17 billion of tax cuts. And that is just set, of course, by the looks of it, to be continued by Labour. A party who boasts about sticking to the Tory spending plans, no matter the cost to people. And the IFS have clearly laid out the choice that Labour need to make with their deputy director saying, and I quote, Unless they get lucky on growth, they would either have to do more on tax rises that they haven't told us about, or they would have to deliver cuts to the public services that have already been hit by the austerity of the 2010s. And a, yes, of course. Pam Duncan Glancy. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that if growth had stayed um, in this country as it was when Labour were last in government, we would have tens of billions of pounds more to spend on public services than we do now? Oh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, actually, what I would say to Pam Duncan Glancy is that on many indicators, the Scottish economy is actually performing better. And in fact, if you look at the recent RBS uh, report, the Scottish economy is the standout performer uh, of the UK. So there is much uh, to be commended about the Scottish e economic performance, but there is work to do. And of course, the issue with migration and the need of, our, of the labour needs of, of our businesses and industry is the point I just made about Brexit and the harm that the, that is doing. I want to turn to some newspaper reports uh, today that, of course, uh, have uh, been uh, generated through senior Labour insiders briefing and admission that a Labour government would make, and I quote, really difficult and pretty unappealing cuts. And therefore, I think there is a, a real issue uh, with Labour not being straight with the Scottish people, calling for more money for local government in their amendment in this place cannot be reconciled to the cuts being signalled for local government by a UK Labour government. That's a fundamentally dishonest position to take, and it cannot be sustained. Presiding officer, I know the current financial situation remains incredibly challenging, but the Scottish Government will continue to prioritise spending effectively to ensure our public services remain sustainable. For example, the medium-term outlook for our capital budget is particularly difficult. The latest forecasts show that our capital block grant is expected to re reduce by almost 9% in real terms between 2023-24 and 2027-28. That's a cumulative loss of over £1.3 billion that we're not able to invest across Scotland to support our public services to remain efficient and effective. Quite simply, if the incoming UK Government doesn't reverse the cuts to capital and deliver a meaningful uplift for investment in public infrastructure, 
They will have to explain why they have followed the path to greater austerity than the Conservatives yeah. have laid. Without that change, there will be a significant impact on the capital investment programme. Yes. Miles Briggs. The, the Cabinet Secretary is calling on others to reflect. I wonder if she has reflected on her time as Health Secretary and the £20 million cut to drug and alcohol partnerships and the drug deaths crisis we see, or the £200 million cut to the housing budget while she was Cabinet Secretary uh, for Social Justice and Housing. Where is the SNP taking responsibility for problems in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary, and give the time well, back for the intervention. Let me say on the housing budget specifically, of course, it's not just the capital cut that we are wrestling with. It's the over 60% cut to financial transactions. Now, I know that Miles Briggs knows that the financial transactions funding is what underpins the affordable housing supply programme. So you cannot have a 60% cut in FTs from the UK government for that not to have an impact on the very programme that it funds. What we need to see, though, is a reversal of both the capital cut and the cut to financial uh, transactions, and that is what we will uh, be pressing for. Presiding officer, the... Uh, the Scottish Government has, uh, of course, uh, um, consistently and proudly prioritised investment in public services, and we will continue uh, to do so. Despite this challenging financial situation, we continue to take bold and ambitious action to protect and improve our public services wherever possible. We are using all of the powers available to us under the current uh, devolution settlement in order to maximise our investment in public services to benefit the people of Scotland. For example, we believe that those with the broadest shoulders should be asked to contribute a little more, and a progressive approach to taxation is central to our investment in public services. And that, of course, delivers £1.5 billion in additional funding to protect our services. So given their opposition to progressive taxation, the simple fact is this, that if Labour were sitting in our seats right now, they'd be delivering £1.5 billion of cuts to Scotland's public services. Presiding officer, I am proud of the Scottish Government's legacy of investing in and reforming Scotland's public services over many years. Across the education and skills sector, we are continuing to invest around £1 billion each year in 1,140 hours of high-quality early learning and childcare. Scotland already has the most generous childcare offer for three- and four-year-olds in the UK, and of course, we also make that available to two-year-olds who need it most. In our health and social care sector. We are working to reduce inpatient and day case waiting lists by an estimated 100,000 patients over the next three years, with planned investment each year to deliver this improvement to such a critical public service. And this comes on top of the £19.5 billion of investment in health and social care. In our justice sector, we are investing £1.55 billion in policing in 24-25, which demonstrates our commitment to keeping people and our communities safe. And this government has spent around £1.2 billion mitigating the impacts of 14 years of UK government policies, such as the bedroom tax and the benefit cap. And this includes almost £134 million this year alone through activities such as our discretionary housing payments and the Scottish Welfare Fund. This is £134 million which could have been spent on other public services. As an example, it would pay for over 2,500 nurses each year if we did not have to mitigate Westminster austerity. We have also invested £2.9 billion in 23-24 across a range of programmes targeted at low-income households, all driving forward our mission to eradicate child poverty. This includes awarding almost £430 million to families through our Scottish Child Payment, with more than 329,000 children benefiting from the payment worth £26.70 per child per week since the end of March this year, literally keeping food on families' tables. And again, with Westminster policies, we have had one arm tied behind our back. One of the quickest interventions that the next UK government could do is, of course, to lift the two-child benefit cap. The Child Poverty Action Group estimate that ending the two-child limit would lift around 300,000 children out of poverty across the UK and 10,000 in Scotland overnight. Labour, of course, is refusing 
to do that. Presiding officer, the cost to scrap the two-child cap across the UK would be £2.5 billion. The cost of keeping Trident is over £3 billion. That is the choice Labour is making, choosing to prioritise billions in nuclear weapons over eradicating child poverty. That is the simple truth of the matter, which is why I will not be supporting the Conservative or Labour amendments today. The fact that Labour is deleting a line in our motion that says we are committed to high quality services and welcome that the public sector pay is higher, a line that not even the Conservatives sought to delete, really does say it all. And I wonder what our trade union colleagues would think about that. However, if the Green Amendment had been selected, I would have supported it, as I do believe that reform on the council tax is needed, and I am committed to making progress on this on a cross-party basis, if we can. The Joint Working Group on Council Tax will continue to operate, chaired by me, and will next meet later this summer after the pre-election period, which, of course, has meant work needed to be paused. It is my intention at that meeting that the group consider the plans uh, for taking forward the Council Tax deliberative engagement to conclude before the 2026 Holyrood elections. I recognise the issues raised uh, in the amendment, which will need to be discussed as part of any reform of the council tax. Presiding officer, as I bring my remarks to a close, it is right that I recognise that invaluable role of Scotland's public sector workforce, the backbone of our society, and they, of course, do much to deliver public services with kindness, dignity and compassion. And I'm, a, I'm proud of our approach to public sector pay in recent years, which means, on average, people in key public sector roles in Scotland are now paid 6 per cent more than in the rest of the UK. We should remember, though, that this gap in public sector pay between the Scottish Government and the UK Government is a political choice from the outgoing UK Government. What remains to be seen is what the political choice of any new incoming Labour Government is uh, to make. So, presiding officer, for as long as the Scottish Government remains on an effectively fixed budget under the current devolution settlement, there are, of course, limits to what we can achieve in terms of investment in public services. However, we will continue to do all we can to invest in our public services. That is the vision of this Government. It is a shame the other parties do not share it and instead want to continue the plans that has brought us austerity, Brexit and the cost of living crisis. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Liz Smith to speak to and move amendment 13602.1 around seven minutes. Uh, thank you. And I move the amendment in my name. Uh, members will know that earlier this week the Finance Committee announced its latest inquiry, this time to investigate the Scottish Government's fiscal strategy in terms of the approach to taxation, the use of capital for innovation and growth, and to analyse what progress has been made in terms of public sector reform all of which are obviously extremely important when it comes to the debate about investing in our public services. The demand for this inquiry at committee has come about partly because of ongoing concerns that have been raised by the Scottish Fiscal Commission when presenting its objective data about the current state of public finances, partly from concerns from Audit Scotland about the lack of effective leadership in some aspects of Scottish Government policy, and partly because of the, Scot the committee's own concerns about the lack of transparency which too often clouds the decision-making process here in Holyrood. And of course, all that is set against the current UK economy, where there have been major issues resulting from high inflation, high interest rates and high mortgage rates. So there is an important and indeed an urgent need about how we uh, stimulate investment and therefore better protection for our public services. Ask many people across the economy and they will tell you that they want the following economic stability, prudent fiscal management, lower taxation and closer alignment of Scottish taxation with UK taxation, a well-maintained infrastructure, fewer barriers to trade and a strong emphasis on training and skills. The huge issue for the Scottish Government, however, is that as a result of its higher tax rates, and not just for those in higher income groups, the public is not seeing any improvement in their public services. In other words, they are paying more and getting less. Now, that is an uncomfortable fact, and we know, I, I want to know in a minute, there is an uncomfortable fact, and we know that because some within the SNP ranks know full well 
that that can't continue. Because if we are going to continue the arg to argue for a higher tax burden, then the taxpayer obviously wants something much better in return. And it hasn't happened. Whether that's to do with educational standards, NHS waiting lists, weak infrastructure including housing, potholes, ferries or an overstretched police force. And that is because the Scottish Government has not placed nearly sufficient emphasis on economic growth, especially during the Butte House Agreement period, when one of the ministers didn't actually agree with economic growth in the first place. And perhaps Mr Greer might like to intervene now. Ross Greer. Uh, I'm grateful to Smith uh, for, the, for taking the, the intervention and uh, to be clear there are many parts of Scotland's economy that the Greens want to see grow and supported the growth of during our time in government, most obviously the renewable energy sector. Uh, but the point I was going to make is that she mentioned that people across the country want to see lower taxation and I'm sure if all else was equal that would be the case. But poll after poll after poll has shown that the majority, the vast majority of people in Scotland are willing to pay more tax if that money is invested in our public services, showing the strong commitment to the social contract in this country. Does Liz Smith not acknowledge that the Conservatives are actually vastly out of line with public opinion on this? Liz Smith, I can give you the time back. Very definitely not, because if you listen to so many people who are running businesses, who are operating within the economy in Scotland, the last thing that they want now is a higher tax burden and a higher tax burden when it comes to differentials with the rest of the UK. So I'm afraid I don't accept that at all. Now, there are some uh, green shoots of recovery. For example, in inward investment in green energy and in uh, life sciences. But the general trend for business and industry, as spelt out in very blunt terms, is pretty depressing. And at the start of the speech, I cited the factors uh, that business and industry want to see in order to be confident about the future. And that's a very strong message that has been sent back uh, to the Scottish Government, both privately and publicly. Uh, and as yet, that, that new deal for business um, as Mr Gray uh, announced uh, earlier in his term um, when he was looking after the economy, um, that has not been working well enough. But another really serious challenge relates to local government. The Scottish Government certainly doesn't need me to tell them that the mood in local government is fractious. There were very high hopes for the Verity House Agreement, but that was blown apart by the failure to engage with local government, whether it came about in the council tax freeze, the question of multi-year budget funding, we still not had an answer on that, um, and, and also because of their uh, years of underfunding. And then on top of that, we've seen an unhelpful standoff between the UK government levelling up money, something that many councils have greatly welcomed, but which the Scottish government seems to have a permanent problem with. Yep. These tensions between Scottish government and local authorities are not helpful, uh, nor is the tension between the UK government and Holyrood because in, in this age of deep mistrust in politics, I, I think that uh, the, the general public want to see different levels of gov government working together. So let me address this issue of capital budgets, because it is important, because we know from economic analysts, and particularly those that are presented to the uh, Finance Committee, there was a cut in real terms to UK government budgets. I acknowledged that at the time with the UK uh, government budget, uh, and more could have been done to protect uh, infrastructure and investment, which, as the Financial Times has pointed out, has been weak in Scotland, but it's also been weak in the UK. But it would be helpful to Cabinet Secretary if we could have an acknowledgement from the Scottish Government that the block grant is at its highest level ever, that the recent of Fraser of Allender analysis makes that abundantly clear, and that it has had uh, additional uh, ability to increase its capital borrowing thanks to the fiscal framework that the Cabinet Secretary signed uh, alongside the UK Government. And let's not forget that the current failures within the Scottish economy are very largely due to Scottish Government policy choices. And it's simply not credible, as some of the... I will in a minute. It's simply not credible to blame everything on Westminster. I've noticed in some of the uh, TV debates about the general election, which I can't comment further on, I, I know that, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer, but that's the point that is being made through many uh, of these uh, debates. I'll take the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary? Well, I, I mentioned earlier on about some of the strengths of the Scottish economy, uh, but would Liz Smith recognise that she's not, Liz Smith is not speaking from a very strong position here when the ONS figures have shown that the UK economy flatlined in April, zero growth in April, apparently blaming, the UK government was blaming the rain at one point. I mean, can she really uh, you know, sit there and stand there and criticise the uh, Scottish 
economy performance when the UK economy has been so poor. We understand the need for economic growth, but that RBS report, standout performer in the UK, is surely something Liz Smith can welcome. Liz Smith. The, the UK economy has not been doing as well as it should be. My point is that the Scottish economy has been even less well uh, in, in terms of its uh, progress. And that's something that has come about because of the choices that have been made right here in Holyrood, not down in Westminster, because I, I simply don't think it's going to wash, Cabinet Secretary, to say that it's always Westminster's fault. It's not. It's broken record. It's, it just goes on and on that we have this, uh, as my colleague has just reminded me, a broken record about this. And it's not going to wash with the public because it's not actually correct. Presiding officer, our, our public services are obviously a vital cog in the wheel of more, more pros prosperous society. But it's not enough to throw more and more money at them because past history shows that by throwing more and more money, it's not actually improving it. We need a restructured economy a new tax structure, and I'm glad to hear that the Cabinet Secretary is making some progress with her uh, commission. We have to ensure that Scotland is the best place for economic innovation and entrepreneurship, and we need to remove the barriers which business persistently claims is holding them back. So I finish my remarks on that. Can we raise the game in terms of the things that we can do to be able to make Scotland a first-class economy in which to invest? Thank you, Ms Smith. And I now call on Mark Griffin to speak to and move Amendment 13602.2. And Mr Griffin is joining us remotely. Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I move the amendment in my name. And just at the outset, give my apologies to the Chamber that I am not on the, the front bench and that I am participating remotely. I tested positive for COVID this morning. And so I am sure that colleagues would much rather that I participate across the screen rather than um, across the chamber and be sharing much more than my opinions. Um, but, President Officer, £5 billion, £5,000 million, that is the amount of public money that the SNP has wasted since they took office. Nearly £300 million for each of the 17 years under this SNP government. In terms of EU funding alone, despite claims otherwise, it's clear that millions will go unspent and unallocated. And these figures are just the latest example of this government's financial incompetence. This isn't just bad management. It, it becomes a betrayal of every Scot who relies on or works in our vital public services. And the truth of the matter is that the SNP, along with the Tories, want us to vote for and accept failing public services and a struggling economy. But we deserve better. We want change. Because every single institution in Scotland has been left weaker by the SNP. And nowhere is that clearer than in our NHS. On this government's watch, our NHS, the finest achievement of, of a Labour government, has been allowed to crumble. With an overstretched workforce and a never-growing patient waiting list, bold changes are, are required. And here are some shocking numbers from our NHS. Over £1.6 billion on agency spending. £1.3 billion lost to delay discharge. That chaos absolutely has to stop. Kate Forbes criticised Hamza Youssef for sticking with the same failing strategies, but nothing has changed since John Swinney became First Minister. And in fact, John Swinney and his deputy have been responsible for over half of this Parliament's budgets. 13 of the SNP's 17 they have had oversight on the vast majority of this government's financial mismanagement. I'll take the intervention from Ms Adam. Thank the member for taking an intervention. I'd like to ask the member, does he truly believe that a Tory austerity agenda, a Tory, a Tory Brexit and a Tory cost of living crisis has had no impact upon our National Health Service at all? They, they clearly have. I just said that after 14 years of Tory chaos, but 17, 17 years of SNP mismanagement have left the NHS in the state that it's in. And that's why this, um, this election is a chance to make the first step along that road to change, the first step along that road to delivering a fit NHS for the people who, who rely on it. But, President Officer, as one of the key delivery partners of our vital public services, I also want to, to touch on local government. 
And since 2013-14, the SNP has cut over £6 billion from our local councils. Bins are, are overflowing, potholes aren't filled, and libraries and sports facilities are being forced to close. Those cuts are hurting every single day. Our local authorities desperately need support, partnership and proper funding. Instead, they get the gimmick of a council tax freeze handed down to them by a Scottish government and funding which doesn't cover it. Now, those are hard facts that you will not hear um, from the government today, that local government core revenue has been cut by 62.7 million, core capital budget cut by 54.9 million. From 2011 to 21, funding for parks and open spaces was cut by over 365 million, library funding by almost 260 million, and street cleaning by over 320 million pounds. Councils face a budget gap of up to £585 million this year, rising to £780 million by 2026 27. Uh, I'll take the intervention by the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Thanks for taking the intervention. I hope you feel better soon. Um, can uh, Mark Griffin uh, give us a categorical assurance that the briefing that has been provided to the newspapers this morning that non-protected areas of spending would be cut under a UK government, which includes courts, prisons, local government, job centres, police and immigration. Can he say categorically that that will not happen? Mark Griffin. I don't listen to off-the-record briefing. I'd advise the Cabinet Secretary not to either. The Labour Manifesto was published, and I'm sure she can have a good read at it and see the kind of change that we'll be delivering for the whole of the UK and hopefully in 2026, further change in Scotland. Because right now, there are more than 1,500 fewer secondary teachers than in 2007. Some areas have been hit harder than others. In my own area of North Lanarkshire, there are 211 fewer teachers. Dumfries and Galloway has 204 fewer. Dundee City has 154 fewer teachers. We can't keep going on like that, because it's not only those who use these vital services that are suffering. It's also those who provide the services who are feeling the brunt of the chaos and incompetence of two failing governments. Public sector workers do invaluable work for our communities, and the Scottish Government must urgently provide clarity to public sector bodies, unions and workers regarding its future plans for the public sector workforce. It's by working true partnership with our public services workforce, growing our economy and investing in our public services, that we will begin to reverse the decline of the past 17 years. That's what Scottish Labour will do. Under a UK Labour government, we will grow Scotland's economy, create jobs and bring new opportunities. We will renew our public services after years of mismanagement. We'll close tax loopholes to fund the NHS and tackle the mental health crisis with real funding increases. We'll put forward a true NHS recovery plan that values staff and promotes health. We'll prioritise the delivery of economic growth in all parts of the country to create jobs, boost incomes, reduce poverty and allow for greater investment in and, crucially, reform of our public services. We will reverse the abject decline in funding local government. President officer, it is time for change. Change that revitalises our public services and puts the needs of the public first. The man who delivered his first budget in 2007 cannot deliver that change. Scottish Labour will deliver the change that we need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Griffin. And I now call on Ross Greer. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm glad that we're having this debate this afternoon, though I am a bit frustrated that we're not having a debate dedicated to the fiscal sustainability uh, of Scotland's public finances, or that we uh, won't have the medium-term financial strategy, the capital spending strategy, or the tax strategy uh, before autumn. I do think that that is disappointing and frustrating, because Scotland's public finances are not sustainable without either huge changes to our tax policy, significant cuts to public services, or some combination thereof. The Parliament's Finance Committee has been trying to get both government and Parliament as a whole to engage with this issue because it is becoming more urgent. Short-term decision-making to balance budgets in-year is consistently resulting in poor value for money for the taxpayer. 
I had some involvement in two rounds of the euphemistically named Path to Balance exercise to close the government's in-year budget deficit. So that was difficult work, resolving the tension between the financial reality and the consequences that would come about from reducing spending on important services. And I do not envy the ministers and officials who have to deal with that every year. But one specific concern that I've got about how we go about uh, causing the in-year budget deficit each year is that certain portfolios are bearing a disproportionate burden here, specifically the education portfolio. If you compare justice and education, for obvious reasons, the justice portfolio uh, spending allocation is largely fixed at the start of the year. There's not much flexibility once you've made those commitments, whereas in education, there is more nominally discretionary spending. But what that means when we've gone through a pattern of year after year, for reasons out with the Scottish Government's control, year after year in year deficits, is that the portfolios with that discretionary spend have had to bear a really disproportionate burden to close it. Uh, not quite at this point, uh, Mr Whittle, sorry. Um, I'm not suggesting that no action has been taken by the government to address the fiscal sustainability challenge. And government ministers are absolutely right to highlight the £1.5 billion that we have additional to spend each year on public services because of the progressive changes to income tax that have been made since 2017. That's the result of changes that were tabled from opposition and within government by the Scottish Greens. And I would ask those who have opposed those measures throughout the last six years to compare the doomsday predictions they've made with the reality. Overall tax take in Scotland from income tax is up. Inward migration from the rest of the UK to Scotland is up. And I think that's because higher quality public services are a pull factor. And on the uh, point of debate that I was having with Liz Smith a moment ago, I just checked the numbers. Only 9% of people in Scotland want lower taxes and less spending. 43% are prepared to pay more to fund public services. And the most recent British Social Attitude survey shows very similar UK-wide figures. I will take this intervention. Liz Smith? I, I have to say that I think I, I very much agree with the initial uh, remarks that he made in his speech uh, about transparency. Does he accept, however, that there are many businesses in Scotland just now who are finding it very difficult to attract highly skilled workers because of the higher tax differential between Scotland and the rest of the UK? Ross Green. Uh, I don't accept that. I do accept that businesses in Scotland are finding acute labour shortages across the board. I think one of the most significant contributions to that is Brexit and the immigration policies of the UK government. But I do think the last six years of income tax change in Scotland reveal how misleading Labour's claims are, uh, that there is apparently no magic money tree, to quote the Labour Party's social media accounts and front bench spokespeople. Because if a UK government was to replicate Scotland's income tax system UK-wide, that would generate more than £11 billion of additional revenue for our public services every year. That's enough to abolish the two-child cap seven times over. So Labour need to be honest. They are making a choice to keep the two-child cap on child benefit in place. They are making a choice to keep 250,000 children in poverty, and they should be straight with the British public about that. You know, the same Labour Party is demanding billions of pounds in extra spending here in Scotland, but voted against raising extra revenue from the top 5% of earners earlier this year. It's not how maths works. You can't spend more with less money. The Conservatives have at least listed some areas of public spending in Scotland they would cut. I obviously disagree with, I think, every example that they gave, apart from maybe one that Liz Smith and I can discuss later on. Uh, but I think there's an honesty uh, there that is lacking from the Labour Party in this debate. If you oppose more revenue raising, you do need to put saving proposals on the table. You know, for example, I think that the small business bonus scheme is poor value for money. I do think small businesses should receive tax breaks and tax incentives, but the way we structure the SBBS at the moment, as the Fraser of Allender Institute found, has no measurable positive impact. There are savings to be made there. There's a restructuring that would also help genuinely small businesses. Obviously, on capital, the Scottish Greens clearly still think that we're spending too much on road expansion compared to road maintenance and other capital priorities. I am proud, though, of the progress that we've made and that the Scottish Greens have been involved with in recent years in areas like the devolution of empty property relief, greater town council tax discretion in relation to second and holiday homes, and the visitor levy that Parliament passed a couple of weeks ago, as well as the commitments we secured to further work, like the cruise ship levy, the public health levy, and the power of general competence. Because, of course, so many of our public services here in Scotland are delivered by local government. But local government has not nearly enough financial discretion of its own, certainly compared to what is the uh, 
the norm across Europe. And, presenting officers, the Cabinet Secretary referenced the Green Amendment looked specifically at council tax and the reality uh, that we are still basing a tax system here in Scotland on property valuations from 1991. Now, I held it off for as long as I could, but I turned 30 earlier this month, and I am younger than council tax valuation. It has not been in date in my lifetime. I cannot imagine that anybody in this Parliament would tolerate a situation where most people in Scotland paid the wrong rate of income tax, and yet the majority of households pay the wrong rate of council tax because the valuations are so out of date. Reform is clearly needed. Reform to our tax system and, yes, reform to our public services so that we can ensure greater value for money for the public. But we will not get that reform unless we can have an honest debate about what the trade-offs are and we can all be honest about how we would make the money add up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Creer. And we now move to the open debate. I call Karen Adam to be followed by Edward Mountain. Ms Adam. Thank you, President Officer. When I think of public services, as I was pondering um, to write this speech today, I automatically thought, I'm sure as many other people do, of the support that they provide us throughout our lives, from the cradle to the grave, often caring and supporting us when we need it the most, in particular our National Health Service. So today I'm going to focus my remarks principally on the institution that gave me my first opportunity to serve the public, the institution which delivered six of my children, two of my grandchildren, took care of my relatives before they passed away, and on so many occasions throughout my life have taken care of me and my family in our hours of need. And I know I'm far from alone in the gratitude and pride that I have in the NHS. This service is a manifestation of our collective commitment to each other, embodying the values of compassion, solidarity and care. The Scottish people look to us to provide investment in the NHS, but not only investment in monetary terms, but investment in the fundamental belief of the institution itself. For many people who stand at a ballot box, they are looking to vote for the NHS, to see a party dedicated to the protection of it. It's a marker of our society. And it goes beyond ensuring that every person in Scotland has access to the care and the support that they need. It's about ensuring that it's there for future generations too, delivering services when we are no longer here. I'm proud to support an SNP Scottish Government which is committed to improving Scotland's public services, particularly our NHS, not as a cost, but as a vital investment in our future health, equality and prosperity. Proof of this investment comes in the form of an NHS workforce in Scotland, currently the highest paid in the UK. Scotland has had the best performing a &E core units in the UK for nine years. NHS funding has more than doubled and we have the highest number of GPs per head in the UK. As a consequence of this SNP Government's decisions, there is £1.5 billion available to spend on public services in Scotland today that wouldn't be available had it not taken the decisions that it has taken on tax. A socially just and progressive approach to public service investment, design and delivery is essential, and it must be underpinned by fair work and a progressive tax policy. This approach ensures that everyone contributes their fair share to the funding of services that benefit all of us. And it's about creating a society where everyone has that opportunity to thrive. However, the challenges we face are significant, and nobody is turning a blind eye to that. The UK spring budget, however, fell far short of what Scotland needs to deliver further investment in public services and infrastructure. This has resulted in a cut in the Scottish Core Block Grant of around £0.4 billion in real terms for 2024-25 compared to 2022-23. Such cuts do hinder our ability to make the necessary investments in our public services. This does not signify to me a priority of the UK Government to deliver for our NHS. Therefore, I support the Scottish Government's call on the incoming UK administration to bring forward an emergency budget to restore the £1.3 billion cut in Scotland's capital budget. For as long as the Scottish Government remains on a fixed budget under the current devolution settlement, there are limits to what we can achieve in terms of investment in public services. It is imperative that we have the resources needed to support them effectively. 
Now, despite these challenges, people in Scotland currently benefit from policies not available in England, Wales or Northern Ireland. These support Scots struggling after 14 years of austerity cuts, such as free tuition fees, free prescriptions, free personal care, the Scottish child payment, the mitigation of the bedroom tax and SNP Scottish Government proving it prioritises its citizens. President officer, my grandmother was a domestic supervisor at the Royal Cornhill Hospital in Aberdeen, and alongside her worked my mother and my auntie. My grandmother had a reputation as a white glove type, ensuring the highest standards of cleanliness and care. And this pride in working for the NHS was a badge of honour in my family, and I took I, do. I did a turn as an NHS domestic at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and I remember the pride that my family felt when I started working there and it was celebrated and before my first late night shift my grandmother had cooked me a special tea to sustain me to make sure that I was fit for the job that she held in high regard. It was a fulfilling and a rewarding job and one of great importance. President officer, public services are the core of our society. They represent our collective commitment to care for one another. We have a deep regard and pride in them, and by investing in these services, we invest in the future of Scotland, which is exactly what this SNP Scottish Government is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Adam. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Mountain. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I, I'd like to start by apologising to the Chamber that, with the Presiding Officer's approval, I've been allowed to leave the debate 15 minutes early to attend an event uh, which I'd rather not be attending, but I have to. So I'm pleased to be able to uh, speak in this debate this afternoon about the provision of services, because the provision of services isn't just the provision of things that we take and need so much, things like the national health, education and such like. It's also the provision of other services across Scotland, like the transport services, which is another pet subject of mine, which I think are really important. And today we heard, very sadly, that somebody last night died on the A9. And I'm sad to report that there's been another accident just this afternoon at approximately 12.30 hours at Dalwini. I haven't heard if that has resulted in a fatality, but I pray not. And we wouldn't be in this situation, I suggest, if the A9 had been duelled when we said it was going to be duelled. I'm sure I don't need to remind the government that on the 6th of December 2011, they announced that they were going to duel the roads between all of Scotland's major cities, including the A9 and the A96. In fact, uh, Alec Neil, I think, was put on the bridge at Lunkety on the 6th of June 2012 to re-announce it. Uh, doing what many governments do, re-announce good news. The trouble is the good news stopped there. We haven't got to that stage where the A9's been duelled. In fact, we only found out last year, uh, or oh, sorry, this year, that it wasn't going to be duelled by 2025, which is when we had promised it was going to be duelled by. Uh, and it was quite clear from the evidence that uh, the previous first minister, one of the previous first ministers, Nicholas Sturgeson, knew that in 2017 that delivery was never going to happen. And it's sad that it didn't happen at that stage for the simple reason that money was available. It was before COVID. It was before uh, any austerity that the Cabinet Secretary believes that she can claim to blame for her failures. I don't believe that is the case. But if we'd done it in 2017, then none of these would have been issued. And I think it's sad as well that when we're talking about it, that when I quizzed uh, Nicola Sturgeon on why it hadn't been done and whether she understood what Alex Salmon had said when he was First Minister, she, her comment was, I'm not sure he and I were on the same cabinet. Well, if they'd been on the same team, which they claimed to be, I'm sure the A9 and the A96 would have been dueled. But that's had a knock-on effect to all the other transport that we have across Scotland. I was looking at uh, the buses, and don't forget we're spending uh, nearly £300 million on concessionary travel in buses across Scotland. And, and where does that actually get us? Well, you know, you can, you can indeed uh, get a bus from Thurso to Inverness. Um, and you can get a bus back from Inverness to Thurso on the same day. You can only spend three hours in Inverness. That's all you can spend. That's all it allows you to do. 
So all that concessionary travel that we're spending on buses isn't really helpful for young people to come to Inverness or older people to come to Inverness because they don't have time to do anything when they get there. So the question is, is the bus concessionary working just for the central belt or does it need to be expanded to make sure that there are sufficient buses across the Highlands to make sure that everyone can benefit? And then let's look at trains. Well, we're spending approximately £1.3 billion a year on trains, on a train service that we've nationalised, and we've seen the services actually reduced. Now, if I don't leave here at a certain time, i.e. before decision time, and that's not why I'm leaving tonight, to ensure that I get the train back at 5.30 to Aberdeen, there's a fair chance that if it's delayed by 10 minutes, I'm not going to get home till tomorrow. That's a strange position to be in. And if you were travelling from Inverness, say, to, to Edinburgh, uh, you could leave at 5 o'clock in the morning and get here for 9.30, not really in time to start work at this Parliament, because I know most MSPs start before then, but you'd have to leave much earlier in the evening before work has finished to get back to Inverness. In fact, I think I was uh, amazed to find that uh, if you wanted to go uh, from uh, Wick uh, down to Inverness uh, that uh, you, you have the principal time of about three hours on the buses to spend in Inverness before you have to get the next bus back. And actually it gets more complicated than that, uh, that uh, if you want to uh, go on the, uh, sorry, on the train uh, back uh, to, to Wick, you, you basically don't even have time to go to a show in the evening. So you'd have to rely on getting the train across to Wick to go to the cinema because all the services that you get in Inverness don't work. So are the trains working? Are that £1.3 billion working in the Highlands? I question it. And then I've got to come to the ferries, probably the biggest uh, white elephant that I've ever seen in my life. We were agreed to £97 million to pay for them. Uh, we've so far spent £300 million. And I don't even think this government are prepared to stand up and guarantee that the Glen Sanex is going to be finished and released from the shipyard, or maybe they are at the end of next month. I don't think they can, because I don't think it will be. I think there'll be another delay coming down the track. And what we've also got is four ferries that have, are down from the Calmac fleet, which are not servicing uh, the islands, which is actually a critical loss to the islands. I will if I've got time. Uh, yes, briefly. Jimmy Halker Johnson. I'm very grateful to Edward Mann for taking the intervention. I was just wondering what, whether he thinks that the, those that use the A9 and the A96 or any of the pothole-ridden roads across the Highlands and Islands who use the ferries that don't work, or like the Curran Narrows, which we had real issues with last year, uh, are reliant on any of the transport, will feel how they'll feel about the SNP government patting themselves on the back for their delivery of services in the Highlands. Edward Mountain. Um, I, I think... You, you know, Mr Halcrow Johnson, as much as I do, that the people of the Highlands feel that they are the forgotten part of Scotland. And it is the central belt that gets the investment, that gets the exceptional money invested on the line between Glasgow and Edinburgh, which cut journey times down by 20 minutes, whereas in the same time frame that it took to build that, we've seen journey times from Perth to Inverness increase by 20 minutes. That's a disgrace. I think I'm out of time, presiding officer, but what I would say is services aren't just about the critical ones that we need, like our health service and education service. It's also providing services for people to get around Scotland, and this government has badly let them down on that basis. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Mountain. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Foisal Chowdhury. Ms. Uh, Ms. McPherson. Thank you, presiding officer. In this 25th year of devolution, there is an opportunity together to reflect on what has been achieved and to consider what we need to do to meet the challenges of the 21st century and achieve where we want to be in another 25, 50, 75 years' time. Because context matters, presiding officer, our collective challenges are complex, our problems are difficult, and many of them in communities like those that I have the privilege to represent, lead back to things that happened in the 1980s. The first years of devolution, when I was a lad, were a time of plenty. Indeed, perhaps more could have been done. And let's not forget that the Labour Party at that time also were guilty of spending money on things that should not have been a priority like £9 billion worth of spending 
on an illegal war in Iraq. Then in 2007, things changed in a number of ways. The SNP came to power for the first time, but also the financial crisis happened. And that should be remembered. Because since that crash has happened, there have been self-inflicted harms from Westminster governments, austerity, Brexit, and the Liz Trust gov uh, government and, and budget in particular. Yes, there have been external factors that have made an impact, like the COVID pandemic and the war in Ukraine. But especially from 2010, the David Cameron government, I think there has been a significant period of mistakes that have caused extreme difficulty and, and made Britain, as the Resolution Foundation have stated, uh, a poor country, a poorer country, with uh, very few rich people. I'll give way. Michelle Thompson. Uh, for allowing my intervention. And just to add to that, is he aware that the UK economy uh, ha has made the slowest recovery of all the large advanced economies from the crash of 2008? And that is highly indicative of issues at macroeconomic level. Ben McPherson. Absolutely. The policies of austerity from the Westminster government not only created social damage and uh, had a negative impact on our public services, but because of that also had a consequential negative impact on our economic performance. And therefore it is remarkable, in my view, that the Scottish Government has delivered such progress in that period since the financial crisis in 2007. I could say a lot about this, but let's just think about the journey of a young person in Scotland compared with the rest of the UK. When young people are born in Scotland, they can benefit from everything in a baby box. If they're eligible, they get Best Start grants. They'll get more support with childcare. If their family requires it, there's the Scottish Child Payment. There's free prescriptions if they need them because of ill health. There's free transport to access education and employment and leisure. There's 90% chance of going into a positive destination or above. There's free tuition at further education institutions. There's more social housing per head of population than elsewhere on these islands. There's safer streets in order to walk around in. There's better wages in the public sector. I could say more and more. Yes, it's not been perfect, but the state of our public services and quality of life in Scotland is better because of the Scottish Government. Part of that has been about progressive tax policy, uh, but I also agree we need to go further on that, and I'm glad to see the commitment to continued reform uh, on the council tax. We'll give way briefly. Uh, Jamie Hawker johnson I'm grateful to, to um, the member for giving way. Does he recognise that the Barnett formula and the record um, uh, block grant allow for higher public uh, spending in Scotland? Ben McPherson. So I think the, the Scottish taxpayer is right to receive the uh, amount of public spending that Scotland gets, given how much this wonderful country contributes and how strong our economy is. What is a tragedy is that public spending in England is not what it should be because of bad choices by Conservative governments. There is more to do, presiding officer, and I look forward to hearing in the months ahead what more the Scottish Government will seek to deliver for the people we represent. But what will make that more challenging, and is making that more challenging, is the 0.4 billion reduction in real terms in our budget this year, and also the fact that there is a projected, under either Prime Minister on offer in the coming election, of between 18 and 20 billion cuts uh, of public investment. I cannot believe that the Labour Party are proposing that they are change when they are going to inflict billions of pounds worth of public sector cuts. That sounds like short change to me. Yeah. And what's more, presiding officer, and I'll conclude with this, 
Having looked through the manifesto today, it is clear to me that the Labour Party is not interested in offering any more powers to this Parliament. So anybody who wants to see this Parliament continue to evolve and become even more capable of delivering for the people of Scotland should know that there is no powers being offered by the Labour Party. Thank you, Ms. McPherson. I call Faisal Chowdhury to be followed by Michel Thompson. Mr. Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to begin by paying tribute to our public service workforce, who in the last few years have dealt with so much. Those in our NHS who put themselves at risk and treated people while we stayed at home during lockdown. Our police force who do a very difficult work keeping us safe our fire service who save our lives every day, and all those who do roles which are not public-facing yet remain vitally important, all the same. It is unfortunate that the hard work of so many of these sectors and so much time is spent working harder to achieve less, trying to cope with the consequences of the repeated underinvestment and chronic mismanagement we have seen from this SNP government. Myself and everyone in the chamber today hears every single week from the constituents example of our public services suffering from underinvestment. We hear from people who are stuck on a waiting list for a vital operation, their lives on hold. Just this week, uh, can I just uh, I have a lot to go through. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you in a minute. Uh, this, just this week, I had a constituent who was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He was told his tumor is growing. Yet, there is an eight-month wait for surgery, and he has no idea when his treatment will start. He is living in a fear for his health and confused on when he will get help. And his experience is far from unique. The number of Scots waiting more than a year for treatment has risen by the fifth in the last year to almost 88,000 people. And while this is happening, we have, we have seen 1.3 billion wasted on delayed discharge and 1.6 billion on agencies' spending. The SNP are leaving Scottish taxpayer to let down by the service which is supposed to be there for them in their greatest time of need. These are issues being seen with underfunding in all our services and the public uh, ultimately pay the price. This is most clear in our local authorities. It was found last month in an accounts commission report that Scottish councils are seeing a budget gap of over half a billion pounds for, year, uh, for the year 2024-25. That is struggling. They represented millions of pounds of cuts to essential public services that the public re rely on, on almost every day. More charges on bins, parking charges, less money for social care, less money for pools or schools. It is shocking that the SNP will stand and dec decry Westminster austerity, while it's constantly ignoring the concern raised by our local authorities over the funding their own public services. For Scotland and United Kingdom to thrive, we must have economic growth. If we want to pursue social justice and fund public services sustainably, then it must be met with economic growth to create jobs and boost wages. Yet the SNP have not been able to deliver the change necessary, and the people of Scotland deserve better. Labour market trends data shows economic Inactivity is higher in Scotland than the rest of the UK. Unemployment is higher than the rest of the UK. And the growth of pay is slower in Scotland than the rest of the UK. And, 
and rather rather ra, uh, and, and and rather than ra, rather than laser focus on the growth of raised funds from public services and create jobs the snp would rather cover up their shortfall by raising taxes on nurses the scottish people have been let down on two fronts by the Tories in Westminster who caused chaos through the fantasy economic by Liz Truss and by the SNP who poured fuel on their fire through mismanagement and waste. The people of Scotland knew, uh, need new leadership which will prioritise growth, reduce poverty and allow for greater investment and reform our public services. People in Scotland need change. A new leadership, which they will get with Labour in Scotland and Westminster. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhry. Uh, point of order, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I wonder if Faisal Chaudhry uh, really should correct the record because he made a factual inaccuracy in his speech about, well, a number, but the one that jumps out is he said that public sector workers in Scotland are paid less than the rest of the UK. They are actually paid 6% more on average, £1,500 uh, on average more than public sector workers elsewhere in the UK. It is really important that there is accuracy here in this chamber, and I hope Faisal Chowdhury will, will correct the record on that point. Uh, what I would say, if I could perhaps reply, Mr Jamie Halker Johnson, thank you. Uh, what I would say is to the Cabinet Secretary that, of course, is not a point of order. Uh, I think uh, everybody in the Chamber is well aware of how uh, the record can be corrected. And, of course, the points that the Cabinet Secretary raised are now on the record. With that, I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Brian Puzzle. Ms Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to support the SNP motion, but also place under scrutiny the quite wild claims made by Tory and Labour alike. Having listened to the debate, both parties are singing from the same hymn sheet, but I would appear consulting with the same economic witch doctor. Now, the Tories used to complain to claim that conservatism brought political, social and economic stability. Yet over the last 10 years, they've given us five prime ministers, seven chancellors and 12 plans for growth. And at the same time, their policies have caused harm to society and the economy, not least via Brexit. The chaos created by the Boris Johnson and Liz Truss premierships displayed a degree of incompetence that was remarkable and Scotland continues to pay the price. So, frankly, the Tories deserve to be dispatched to the dustbin of history. Yeah. But along comes Labour claiming to be the party of change. If Labour were genuinely interested in pursuing change for the better, they would be seeking to reverse Brexit. Yeah. Instead, they're silent. Yeah. What an act of political cowardice. Yeah. And on the point around the fiscal package announced today by the Labour Party, that equates the tax rises spending pledges to around 0.2% of GDP. So I will hear no claims about what the Labour Party is going to do for public services. Indeed. So in recent times, Keir Starmer, Rachel Reeves and David Lammy have commented on who they claim were the great change leaders of the past. Not Clement Attlee, who oversaw the creation of the NHS. Not Harold Wilson, who introduced the Open University. No, it's none other than the Margaret Thatcher they trumpet, that destroyer of communities who didn't even believe in society. Both the Tory and Labour manifestos claim they'll get more funds by closing tax loopholes, thereby collecting billions of pounds. But they cannot spell out how they will be done, and I'm happy to be intervened upon. And neither are they willing to tackle the vastly overcomplicated tax system in the UK that's full of exploitable tax loopholes. Yeah. Similarly, Tory and Labour claim they'll immediately save lots of money by pursuing productivity gains in, for example, the NHS. This is fantasy land stuff. Yeah. So we shouldn't be surprised that we're in for another dose of austerity if Labour come to power. You only need to listen to Rachel Reeves' commitment to current Tory policy. As recently as March this year, speaking at the Cass Business School, she unveiled Labour thinking. Stability of a particular sort was emphasised. 
most critically. She aims to keep the fiscal rule that, as the Institute for Fiscal Studies has pointed out, is the greatest bind on policy. And that is the need to have debt falling as a share of national income. The IFS and others have also pointed out this rule is a completely arbitrary invention of the current government. Current government. Not only will Labour keep the Tory rule, but they are determined to ensure it imbibes their government too. Here are the words of Rachel Reeves. Debt must be falling as a share of the economy. And she goes on to say, I will end the practice of the Chancellor being able to scrap the rules at any time. She's supposed to be making the rules, not following the Tory ones. Yeah. This, in case there was any doubt, is one of the main reasons why many bodies have pointed to the coming of significant cuts under Labour, and now admitted by Labour, a minimum of £18 billion. That's the starting figure. Members and ladies and gentlemen watching this, they're not only putting on a Tory straitjacket, they're going to tighten the Labour belt. Let's consider the practical implications. Earlier this year, Labour's West Treating, writing in the sun, vowed to fight middle class lefties who oppose expanding the NHS's use of private health care. He wants to expand the invasion of privatised health care. And Streeting has accepted around £175,000 from two donors with links to private health care firms. So it's not, perhaps not surprising Labour have dropped their NHS not for sale commitment. In the past two years, private equity firms have struck 150 deals for UK health care companies, according to figures reported by the Financial Times and cited in The Guardian. These firms have brought up, bought up ambulance fleets, eye care clinics and diagnostic companies. And as Hetty O'Brien from The Guardian so rightly concluded in an article last August, and I quote, when asked how he would deal with the NHS crisis, Shadow Health Secretary West Treating echoed his Conservative counterparts and pledged to use private companies to reduce waiting lists. For investors, it was a show of support. For patients, it's a worrying indication that our politicians have little intention of arresting the decline of our public health service. The implications go beyond those cited by Hetty O'Brien. If new investment in England and Wales is undertaken by this privatisation model, there will be no Barnet consequentials. Just one more example of how our public services in Scotland are just as much at risk with Labour as the Tories. The only way to protect our public services in Scotland is by securing our independence as soon as possible. Thank you, Ms Thompson. And I call Brian Whittle. Mr Whittle. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, one of the benefits of being in the middle of an election campaign is that we politicians get to ask our constituents every waking hour what is really important to them in their daily lives. Yep. And Deputy Presiding Officer, more often than not, the answers bear little resemblance to what we debate in this chamber. Yep. I'm sure I'm not the only MSP who is constantly hears about potholes, difficulty in getting a GP appointment, yep. waits to access treatment in the NHS, lack of places at university for Indigenous Scots, yep. cuts to further education places, lack of investment in transport infrastructure, and yes, tax differentials are increasingly raised on the doorstep. Unfortunately and predictably, the Scottish Government have doubled down on and increasingly rely on their fallback position of it's not us, it's them. Yep. Interestingly, it's very noticeable uh, that uh, this excuse is increasingly wearing thin with the public. Presiding officer, the, the SM. I give it to. Who's he going? Oh, sorry, I was looking for you there. Yes, I will give it to you. Cabinet Secretary New Gray. Uh, of course, we take responsibility for the performance of our public services, which is why we've taken the decision to increase taxation uh, for uh, those uh, that can uh, best. Uh, pay it so that we can invest in our public services. But of course, Brian Whittle needs to be honest with his constituents when he's talking about uh, challenges in our public services. Because if uh, his plans were followed, we would have seen less investment in our public services, like the NHS, and so uh, even greater challenges uh, faced by them in accessing them. Uh, why won't he be honest uh, with the people of Scotland uh, around the impact that Tory plans have for our public services? Yeah. Brian Whittle. 
And in, and in that uh, intervention, which I'm very grateful for, we, we realise why the SNP have failed for the last 17 years. They failed to invest in our public services, and the frustration is that so much could be achieved, should have been achieved. However, there are so many examples, like we've just heard, that point to the SNP's addiction to pop politics and headline grabbing to the detriment of delivering outcomes. For example, Mr Gray, the Scottish Government are very fond of the term record funding for our health service, yet fail to explain why I have the worst health outcomes. Yep. Throughout the time that the SNP have been in office, Scotland has had the worst health record of any European country, from the scandalous rise in drug and alcohol deaths to lower life expectancy and still reducing children today born in Scotland have a lower life expectancy than their parents for the first time in history. Scotland is one of the most obese countries in the world. Yep. We've got higher levels of cancer, higher levels of heart disease and type 2 diabetes, as well as a record numbers suffering from poor mental health. Our poor health record leads to higher levels of economic inactivity, which in turn has such a negative impact on our economy. And remember that pledge by the then First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, improving education would be their primary target, yet we see declining standards against international tables, a huge reduction in uh, FE places, a cutting of the budget for apprenticeships that are so essential for our green economy potential and that just, tra that just transition that is so talked about. And then there is their universities that are increasingly reliant on foreign student income to make the books balance to the detriment of indigenous Scottish students who increasingly find it difficult to access university places, especially for critical careers such as medicine. Yep. We need more doctors, yet some Scots with the qualification to study medicine are being denied that opportunity. It doesn't have to be this way. Yep. And I have to say, uh, I was slightly uh, uh, concerned that I was going to agree with uh, a point that Gross Greer made, something that doesn't happen very often, but a long-term strategy. We need a long-term strategy focused on the problems we're trying to solve, integrating approaches across portfolios, in this, uh, I will, uh, not just now, uh, is, is the solution. Understanding that investment in certain areas impacts on us. For example, our poor health record is the biggest drag of economic performance, as I've said. The focus has been relentlessly on more finance into the health service, of recruiting more healthcare professionals to try and match the increasing need, rather than taking a step back and recognising there is also another side of the coin that must be addressed. How do we reduce the need? How do we get better at retaining staff? Mm. It is a more difficult issue to tackle, which will take a longer term view. Now, I would advocate that the main solution to our poor health record, well, poor health record rel uh, relies on what used to be the SNP's declared focus in investment in their educational environment. In our schools, the issue to tackle the poor physical and mental health, behaviour, attainment, and in some cases, hunger and malnutrition, which of course is not necessarily related to hunger. Uh, um, uh, we are need to allow our kids in, um, in prior to the school day. Uh, and maybe offer them some activity along with an offer of a healthy breakfast, I think would be a significant move, tackling the real issues. Mm -hmm. Deputy Presiding Officer, we are chronically short of engineers and tradesmen and women for the transition to the green economy, yet the Scottish Government are underfunding the FE sector and cutting apprenticeship places. Mm -hmm. In what world does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. All the Scottish Government are doing is ensuring that they will not make their climate change targets. They won't be able to take full advantage of the opportunities our economy, uh, for our economy that the growth in the green economy offers. And of course, the Scottish Government will then rely on their built-in excuse of the UK Government's fault. Now, I'm, not, I, I, I'm coming to, to, the, to the end, but one of the solutions uh, to the problem of our overstretched healthcare workers is to develop a better environment for them to work in and free them up as much time as possible to deliver the healthcare they are trained to do, not bog them down in administration. We have so many strengths in Scotland in the AI and life sciences. Why do we not ut utilise them to change the healthcare environment? I realise I'm coming to the end of my speech, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and just to say there are solutions if only the Scottish Government lift its head above the parapet just for a moment. Mm. Outcomes, Deputy Presiding Officer, that is what matters. Yep. Invest in education and you invest in health and in justice and economy and welfare. I am afraid that is something that somehow does not filter through to the Scottish Government, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Pizzo. And We will now move to closing speeches. And I call on Ross Greer to close on behalf of the Scottish Greens. Mr Greer.
Thank you, President Officer. I um, will start by just picking up where I finished my previous remarks on local government finance reform and uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for indicating the government's support for what was in the Greens proposed amendment uh, and also for uh, making the, the point that this should be a cross-party effort that we make on local government finance reform. I definitely welcome those remarks. If I pick the Cabinet Secretary up correctly, the work that she said that will be advanced uh, over the remainder of this year would include the commitment that was made earlier this year to consider a power of general competence for local government. Um, if I have picked up correctly, if the front bench could confirm that. I see the Cabinet Secretary nodding, so I'll take that as confirmation that I understood that correctly. Because I think that would genuinely be transformational for local government. The challenge we've got in Scotland at the moment is we have a tier of government that we refer to as local government, but it's not particularly local. These 32 authorities are massive by the standards of European uh, local government, and it can't actually do very much governing either. The power of general competence would be one really critical step towards giving them genuine power to govern in their local areas. And I should say, bear in mind that my previous remarks focused quite a lot around um, the success we've had with progressive income tax. The Greens absolutely recognise that additional funds for public services can't just come from increasing individual tax liability. That's why we pushed during our time in government for the reintroduction of a public health levy and for the carbon emission land tax. And on the public health levy in particular, I would highlight the point that Scotland has introduced minimum unit pricing for alcohol, quite rightly for public health reasons. But as it stands, minimum unit pricing without a public health levy actually increases the profits of particularly supermarkets. Considering that Parliament has agreed to increase the minimum unit price, quite rightly, I think a public health levy would be a very effective step to take alongside that to collect the additional revenue that is being raised currently going into the pockets of the supermarkets and to instead direct that into the health service, particularly into uh, addiction recovery services. Now, the Poverty Alliance, Oxfam and others challenged the First Minister recently uh, on the point that Scotland is already a wealthy country. And in fact, the amount of wealth in this country has grown considerably in recent years, but it's hugely unequally held. That's why the Scottish Greens are campaigning at the moment for a wealth tax on the top 1%. That's those with assets of about £3.5 million and above. People in that category have only got richer, much richer, in recent years as everybody else struggled during the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. Now, the model wealth tax that we proposed based on a paper from the University of Greenwich, if applied UK-wide, would generate at least £70 billion a year. And that's if you assume a very high rate of avoidance. It could be up to £130 billion a year, assuming the lower uh, end of the, the range of avoidance estimates. I think these debates about our, our public finances are fundamentally about honesty, because they are about how we can afford it. The block grant in Scotland has not come close to keeping up with inflation and pay demands in recent years. And we need to face up to the fact that we either cut or radically reform services to generate savings, or we raise additional revenue from elsewhere. We cannot continue going on as we are. And the onus, as I said earlier, is on everybody calling for more spending to engage in the financial reality of that. I would commend the SDUC's paper from late last year as a good place to start. But I don't want to negate uh, or neglect the need for public sector reform. I'm a fan of a big state. I think government should be the expression of the, the popular will of society. It's where we share power and resources and where we can do transformational things together, especially to protect our most vulnerable neighbours and to protect this planet. There are huge challenges like the deeply embedded inequality present in the UK and the climate crisis that require a big coordinated response, the kind that only government, the state, can lead the delivery of. So I want to see a bigger state in Scotland. I want to see it do more to meet the needs of people on planet. But I don't want just what we've got now on a bigger scale. We need far, far more efficient and accountable public service provision. But there's one success story that I want to highlight of reform in recent years, um, and it's Screen Scotland within Creative Scotland. I think that's had a transformational impact because, uh, believe it or not, based on what colleagues have said earlier on, there are areas of the Scottish economy that the Greens really want to see grow and that we're proud to have played a role in growing. And one of them is our film and TV industry. Ten years ago, our film and TV professionals were embarrassed by the state of the sector and the lack of support it received. We now have world-class studios. They're booked out and turning business away. The value of film and TV in our economy doubled from 2019 to 21. The sector is employing record numbers of people in a vast range of roles, and our international reputation 
population is rapidly growing. And the team at Screen Scotland have been absolutely critical to that. They're passionate about what they do. They have an excellent relationship with the sector and a clear purpose. And they are a relatively new part of our public sector landscape. I still believe that they need to be a separate unit, uh, within, uh, separate from Creative Scotland. But I think what has been achieved in recent years is a blueprint for other areas of public sector reform that generates considerable economic return for Scotland overall. Uh, very briefly, if there's time for enough. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, Ben McPherson. I agree with everything that Mr Greer said, and I just wondered if he would like me to help organise a visit to the new film studio, fairly new film studio in Leith, to see more of the excellent achievements. Greer? Uh, I think a cross-party parliamentary field trip to the film studio at Leith is exactly what we need during an election campaign to foster a bit of cross-party cooperation. Uh, and that film studio at Leith, I think, is the centrepiece of uh, Screen Scotland's success because they were critical to securing that, and it is consistently booked out with world-class productions at the moment, something that we should be really proud of. Very briefly in closing, presiding officer, there's a few additional points I'd like to make. One is about sharing data within the public sector. The David Hume Institute have made it very clear that there's a huge economic loss in Scotland from the lack of availability of public sector data to the tune of about £2 billion every year. I think there's much more that uh, we can achieve there. Plenty of additional points I'd like to make, particularly around NHS reform, but I can see that the clock... In closing, I would simply say that I think we need to make more time for debates like this on a regular basis to explore public sector reform and the management of our public finances. It's a key topic. It cuts across every portfolio area and it affects the lives of everyone in Scotland. So I hope this afternoon can be the start of a more constructive cross-party discussion going forward. Thank you, Mr Greer. And I now call on Pam Duncan Glancy to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to close this debate for Scottish Labour today because the value of public services cannot be understated. Like Karen Adam, Michelle Thompson, Brian Whittle, Edward Mountain, Foisal Chowdhury, and many others across the Chamber, I'm sure, I recognise the value of their efforts of people who work in public service and of public service in general, not just because of my political beliefs or from my constituents' testimony, but from my own lived experience. It's no secret, as I've said in the past, I've relied heavily on public services, some more than others. If it wasn't for the NHS and the social care system, my opportunity to live, study, work, achieve my aspirations and more would have been far out of reach. And I, I'm hugely privileged to also have worked in one of our most cherished public services too, the NHS. It's because of this recognition of the value of public service that I and my party are passionate about building them, protecting them and, importantly, growing our economy and managing public money properly to fund them. Sadly, Presiding Officer, this is not an approach that other parties in this chamber share. We have heard much from the government benches today about their support for public services, but let's take a look at their record. Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Now, of course, uh, when it comes to Labour's plans for cuts, we don't need to read Anna Sarwar's uh, lips. We just need to look at what the experts have to say. And in response to uh, Labour's manifesto today, I'll just take one uh, expert analysis, and that's from Gemma Tetlow, Chief Economist at the Institute for Government. She said, like the Conservatives, Labour has done little to roll back on the spending cuts already pencilled in for the next Parliament. Why was she able to say that, reading the Labour manifesto? Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for that intervention. As I'm going on to point out, the cuts that this government have handed down to local government, to education and to the NHS, I'll come to that for the member who's um, shouting from a sedentary position. Um, I, I, will, I will come to that, but I'll be taking absolutely zero lectures on cuts or public finances from this SNP government. Because, as we've heard much from this government about their support for public services, let's look at their, their record on them. Can I get my time back, President Officer, if I do? Uh, yes, you can. Thank uh, you, President Officer. Kevin Stewart. And I thank uh, Pam Duncan Glancy uh, for taking the intervention. Uh, does she agree with Wes Streeting that when it comes to uh, financing for the NHS and public services, all roads lead to Westminster? And what we are about to see, President Officer, from a Labour government is exactly the same as from a Tory government, which is public service cuts. 
uh, and that is not good enough. And maybe Ms Duncan Glancy uh, can reply to that and say what change thank you, Labour Mr. really thank offers, because it is none. Ms Duncan Glancy has got the gist. Ms Duncan Glancy. I, I thank the member for that intervention and for the invitation to say what change means, and I will indeed come to that um, later in my contribution. In education, on this Government's watch, this is a huge issue, as my committee colleague Ross Greer has touched upon today too. Teacher workloads are increasing, teaching has become a precarious career, and across the country, teacher posts are at risk, including 450 in Glasgow alone. The Government say they put £145 million into local authorities to protect teacher numbers, but that is against the savage cuts to local authority budgets of over £6 billion since 2014. This money simply does not protect teacher jobs. It could be, and in many cases has been, spent several times over plugging SNP gaps. This is not valuing our schools as public services. And anyone who heard what I did in committee yesterday will know that the government's record of supporting colleges as public services is no better either. Across Scotland, colleges face cut after cut, year after year, leaving them on what the government's own skills adviser has called a burning platform, with staff striking in nine of the ten last years because government cuts have undermined their pay and conditions, and fewer students able to go to college in the first place. And I agree with Shona Struthers, who said yesterday to committee that the inevitable cycle of less for less will impact social and economic development of Scotland and that it beggars belief that this government is allowing this to happen to colleges on their watch. That is not recognising the value of colleges in, as public services. That is decimating them. And, presiding officer, on the public service of keeping a roof over our heads, the government also fails. Housing remains grossly underfunded and unavailable. And in the midst of a housing crisis, this government's response was to slash the affordable housing budget by nearly £200 million. And even the former First Minister, Hamza Youssef's last attempts to save his job only reinstated a mere £80 million of that budget. It remains a devastating cut, especially for the 10,000 children living in temporary accommodation. That is not recognising the value value of affordable housing as a public service. I will give way to Ben McPherson, who is all first. Ben McPherson. Uh, I thank Pam Duncan Glancy for giving way, and uh, she is absolutely, uh, of course, uh, able to articulate some of the problems that we face as, as a collective in our society. But I just do not understand how £18 billion worth of public sector cuts being proposed by her party are going to help in any of these areas in any way. Pam Duncan Glancy. So um, I, I respect the member and his contributions largely in, in committee as well and on finances. And the member will know that the, government, the, the budget, the figure he's quoting is from the Institute of Fiscal Studies, I believe. And that is the fiscal studies, the clues in the title, they look at government spending as it is today. We don't accept that version of government spending. And actually, when, as you will hear, as I come on to it, we have plans to change the way that public services are supported in Scotland and across the UK. Despite the tireless efforts of our staff in the NHS, it too has been let down by this government, as many colleagues, including Liz Smith and others, have pointed out. It has been plagued by record waiting times, with 800,000 people on waiting lists, millions spent on agency staff whilst care staff are shortchanged, citizens forced to spend thousands on private health care – I know the members on those benches do not like to hear that, but it is true – and because of this government's failure to deliver reform, £1.3 billion Cabinet Secretary, has been spent on delayed discharge since this government committed to eradicate. It. Officer, these are not the actions of a government that values public service, but the good news is change is coming. And so in closing, presiding officer, despite what members on the government benches claim, an incoming Labour government will restore economic stability, grow the economy, unleash investment, boost wages, create jobs and protect public services in all of Scotland and across the UK. We'll tackle tax dodging to usher in more money and more appointments in the NHS. We'll tackle tax avoidance to tackle poverty. We'll reform planning to unlock opportunities for house building, invest in state schools by making private schools pay their fair share and we will tax the eye-watering profits of oil and gas giants to bring down energy bills. That is the change Labour offers and that is the change the public know and want. Thank you, President Officer. 
Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. I now call on Miles Briggs to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Mr uh, Briggs. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And like others, can I uh, start by thanking and paying tribute to those who work in our public services? Um, as others have said, they are the backbone of our society and we should thank them for the work they did. And I, I never stop thanking them for the work they did during, during the pandemic. I think it's something we should recognise uh, every day in this Parliament. Um, now, during the SNP leadership election, the one in 2023, the, new, uh, the now Deputy First Minister Minister famously, or perhaps for SNP benches, infamously said of the former First Minister, you were the Transport Minister and the trains were never on time. You were the Justice Secretary and the police were stretched to breaking point. And now as Health Secretary, you've got a record, we've got a record high waiting times. Now, I have to say I don't agree with the Deputy First Minister because I don't think she should have just blamed the former First Minister. It is something this government needs to take responsibility yeah, yeah. for, and they haven't. And today, I think, has demonstrated just that. Um, and what, after 17 years of this government, has become an easy comfort zone of just blaming others. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this debate has probably uh, really shone any light on where the Scottish Government genuinely could, and Parliament genuinely could, transform and reform our public services. Now, the First Minister's first, um, if there's time in hand, yes, yeah. A little bit of time, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank Miles Briggs for giving way. Of course, we do uh, take responsibility. I set out uh, last week a debate on health service reform, uh, and as I pointed out to uh, his colleague uh, Brian Whittle, we have taken responsibility to raise revenue for our public services in Scotland. Now, I understand that the Conservatives oppose that, but they need to be honest with the people of Scotland that that would mean a reduction in the money that is available for our public services. So when they come here complaining about the impact of austerity, they need to be plain and honest about the fact that they would see even further reductions for the investment in our public services. Miles Briggs? Yeah. Coming on to that in my speech, and I actually welcomed um, last week what the Health Secretary said. And it's something I've been calling for for the time I've been in this Parliament, that we need to have a national conversation over where our health service is. And the fact that every single week we as MSPs are raising problems in our health service um, needs us to actually look in the mirror and see why is that the case? And I think we should start by looking at Audit Scotland's reports. Uh, the workforce challenges which they have highlighted, and you know, I state, uh, I quote from them, the Scottish Government needs to act uh, quickly to deliver services differently. They've called on the Government to act on the workforce crises um, which our NHS has faced for too long. Um, and on the economic strategy, you know, Audit Scotland have said the Scottish Government's economic strategy lacks political leadership. Now, there can be nothing more uh, condemned uh, than Audit Scotland saying politicians in the government are not actually pro providing the leadership we need to grow our economy, to deliver our public services. Now, I want to touch upon um, the recent uh, declaration of a housing emergency by the Scottish Government. Um, that is welcome, and each week we have seen local authorities. Last week we saw Borders Council, and, and just this week South Lanarkshire Council declaring housing emergencies. But we need to see a fundamental look at how we're delivering housing in Scotland. I have consistently raised the issue of children living in temporary accommodation. The numbers are now through the roof, but ministers haven't done things differently. They've put more and more pressure on local authorities at the same time as taking away funding from them. That has delivered this housing crisis. And ministers need to take responsibility for that. The charitable sector have been asking to be part of solutions, calling on ministers to let them in. But we haven't seen that taking place. And we are now in a position where we have another national emergency. We can't just see every single part of our public services become emergency status. Now, the Cabinet Secretary... Um, mentioned, uh, or no, hasn't mentioned yet, reforming our public services. And I do think over the last 17 years, the SNP government have neglected that opportunity and we haven't seen the real uh, potential, uh, which I think our public services have, to be improved. And although the Cabinet Secretary for Health is now launching a national conversation, I don't think we really know the direction of travel uh, which ministers want to take. Now, at general questions earlier today, I raised the issue of children being placed in adult services. And looking at our mental health services, we have not reformed them over the course of the last 25 years to, to deliver 
the levels we need. When we're going to say we want a parity of esteem between health and mental health, we need to make sure our mental health services are there to respond. Now, one of the, uh, the areas which I think is of interest and something I hope the Cabinet Secretary for Health is looking at is some of the reforms which um, are now happening in London, for example, with regards to the Met uh, police force. Uh, because I know from my casework, and I'm sure every single member does, when someone is in a mental crisis, mental health crisis or in distress, and we send Police Scotland as the response. That is completely inappropriate. We then see them taking them to an accident and emergency part department where that individual will sit with police for hours and not get an outcome. They'll be taken home. They might have a review of their meds. But we need to see something differently. Again, reforming services to include uh, the third sector to be able to deliver a different outcome is important. And that's where right care and right person, which is now being delivered as a different model by the Met Police, is something I think we need to look to as a country as well. It delivers an outcome and a different response. Well, if I have time... Yeah. Uh, Kevin Stewart? Um, I understand what Mr Briggs is saying about the right person at the right time. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have uh, the distress brief intervention projects going on in here, here in Scotland. It may be a police officer that intervenes, it may be a paramedic, it may be a social worker, but it will be a trained person. And that is the right thing to do. Uh, and I think that in some regards, um, Mr Briggs and maybe his colleagues need to look at what is going on across the country already uh, in regards of how we treat folks uh, with uh, mental health distress. Miles Briggs? And, you know, the, the member will know by interest in this and the work I've done in my time in Parliament. Here in my own region, in West Lothian, for example, that intense uh, at-home nurse team to stop children being clinicalised, I think, is a really important step forward. Uh, but to go back to uh, the Met... Uh, the different model which the Met are taking forward. The Met Commissioner, Sir Mark Rowley, stated, we are failing people first by sending police officers and not medical professionals to those in mental health crisis and expecting them to do their best in these circumstances, but not with the right people supporting uh, that patient. Now, my colleague um, and friend Liz Smith sta stated in opening this debate that the current failures within the Scottish economy are very largely due to Scottish Government policy choices from not passing on support to Scottish businesses to anti-growth agenda, which we've seen uh, very much brought forward by the Greens when they were at the heart of this government. Now, I agree with that, and I believe it is time for Scottish Government ministers to dedicate themselves to growing our Scottish economy, to deliver the funding we will then be able to enjoy for our public services. We are seeing also a shift in population in Scotland. It's not something I think ministers have acknowledged or taken forward quite yet. But in Scotland, we are seeing a population shift from west to east, which isn't being reported on. But in years to come, that will see significant challenges for our country. Edinburgh and the southeast of Scotland is the only part of our Scottish economy still growing and economically active. And we are also seeing 80% of potential future growth in the Scottish population here in my region, in Edinburgh and the South East. I don't know if I'm pushing I, I, it for extra time. I think the member should time. be starting to conclude. Yes. Uh, that's why I have consistently championed investment in our public services here in Lothian and why I think Scottish Government need to also now look at funding formulas in a way which they haven't wanted to and which I've raised with both Cabinet Secretaries uh, consistently. Edinburgh is the lowest funded council. Edinburgh uh, Lothian is the lowest funded health board but we are seeing all the pressures of growth. I know some colleagues in this chamber uh, would support that on the SNP benches as well. Something we need to see our public services being able to respond to. So to conclude Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland is facing many challenges in delivering sustainable public services. We all acknowledge that. What we need is solutions from this government, not simply a blame game. And I support the amendment in my colleague Liz Smith's name. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Briggs. And I now call on Neil Gray, Cabinet Secretary, to uh, wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Uh, if you take us to decision time at five, that would be most helpful, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, this debate has highlighted uh, the dedication, the commitment of this government to invest 
in our public services to better the lives of people across Scotland. However, it is also reflected on the challenging fiscal environment uh, we are currently within. And I reflect upon the contribution that I've just heard from Miles Briggs, and I, I wish to engage with him on uh, the work that he is seeking to pursue around uh, mental health. But while he has asked for that additional investment in mental health, he then concluded his remarks by saying that we needed to uh, pursue uh, business tax cuts yeah. uh, instead of investing in our health service. Uh, and he has also failed to answer the question as to uh, where we would get the money from in order to see an increased investment in our health service if it wasn't for the more progressive taxation uh, choices that we have taken. Uh, what has also not helped uh, in this debate, uh, in this uh, work that we have been pursuing, uh, has been the cut to the Scottish Block Grant of just under half a billion pounds in real terms in 2024-25 compared to 2022-23, as was outlined by Karen Adam in her inspiring uh, contribution on the pride of public services. And uh, like her, uh, like uh, Miles Briggs, uh, like uh, Foisal Chowdhury uh, and Pam Duncan Glancy, I want to pay tribute to our incredible uh, public sector workers who do an outstanding job uh, in the service of the people of Scotland. Uh, what was uh, made uh, clear by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance in opening this debate is that regardless of the current limitations upon us, we are using all the powers available to us within the current devolution agreement to focus and prioritise maintaining and building sustainable and effective public services. Because investing in our public services is one of this government's key priorities. I only wish it was a priority for other prior parties in this chamber. Of course I will. Miles Briggs. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking this intervention. We are marking 25 years of the Scottish Parliament being in existence. Over that time, and collectively with UK government additional funding as well, we've doubled the amount of money we've spent in our health service. I welcome that and have always supported that. We haven't doubled outcomes. In fact, in some cases, outcomes are going down. Yeah. Has he done any work to look at that and why we're not getting more out of our health services, even though we've put more investment in over decades? Cabinet Secretary. O of course, and this goes back to the points that I was raising in uh, the discussion on reform that I instituted last week, which is about the need for us to ensure that we're investing in preventative measures. Now, it's not something that uh, is only just going to be starting. The work that we do on the vaccination programmes, the work that we do uh, on uh, in, in minimum unit pricing, is preventing further ill health from uh, ensuring uh, that we are uh, making progress with our health services. And, of course, the investment that we're making uh, to ensure that 100,000 children are uh, kept out of poverty yeah. has a direct consequence on the outcomes that we will see within our health services. Yeah. So, of course, I will I'll be more than happy to have that discussion and debate with, with Miles Briggs and, and others. Presiding Officer, Shona Robeson opened the debate by highlighting key areas of investment from the Scottish Government. This is only some of the investment we have uh, made in our public services. In addition to what we have heard so far, within my own portfolio of health and social care, in the 24-25 budget, it provides record funding of over £19.5 billion for NHS recovery, health and social care, a real terms uplift. We have invested more than £14 £14.2 billion from this funding in our NHS boards with additional investment of over half a billion pounds, an almost 3% real terms increase. Despite having one hand tied behind our back by Westminster austerity, as was so eloquently highlighted by Ben McPherson in his contribution, our investment in affordable housing in 2024-25 is nearly £600 million. Since 2007, we have delivered over 40% more affordable homes per head of population here in Scotland than in England, and 70% more than in Wales. Of course I will, for the last time for this moment is boasting about housing investment and yet he acknowledges we're in the middle of a housing crisis. How did that happen? Cabinet Secretary. So, we've got to reflect on the financial reality that the government is currently working with. We've seen a £1.3 billion cut to our capital budget. Financial transactions reduced by 60%. So, in spite of some of those cuts, we've still delivered a far higher per head of population level of housing, house building under this government than in England or indeed in Wales. Of course, challenges still persist, but we are making those investments. In the education and skills sector, and I declare an interest, my wife is a teacher, that Scotland has the highest level of spending per pupil in the United Kingdom, the highest teacher-pupil ratio. We invested £8,500 
per, per school pupil last year in Scotland, compared to 7,200 per pupil in England and in Wales. Uh, since the SNP abolished tuition fees, the number of new Scottish university students has grown by 31 per cent, and we have a record number of students from our most deprived communities. In Social Security, the Government is spending record sums this year, £6.3 billion for benefit expenditure. Uh, this is £1.1 billion more than the UK Government gives to the Scottish Government for Social Security, demonstrating our commitment to tackling poverty, supporting people, uh, avoiding the need for people to rely on those public services. Yeah. And we're investing £614 million in new benefits and payments that are only available in Scotland, such as our landmark Scottish Child Payment. Uh, I wish to turn to a couple of the comments uh, that uh, have been made from the front bench as President Officer. Uh, Liz Smith uh, made uh, the point uh, around the block grant. Of course, the block grant uh, is lower in real terms in 2009-10 uh, for the 10 years to 2020-2021, 10 years of underinvestment, a decade of austerity. Uh, and in recent years, there has been a 4% real terms decrease in total block grant expenditure between 2022 uh, and 2024-25. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to in, in a second. Uh, I also uh, wish Mark Griffin well uh, for uh, recovery from uh, COVID, uh, but I must challenge both his assertion and that of Pam Duncan Glancy on local government funding. Of course I recognise the challenges that there are across public services uh, because of a decade and a half of austerity that we have faced. But uh, the uh, Accounts Commission confirmed that this government in the last year has passed on a real terms increase to local government uh, in contrast uh, to that has, that has been uh, done elsewhere in the UK. I am very sorry to Liz Smith. I will try to make progress and come back to her if I can. Uh, I also wish to uh, highlight the very helpful contribution uh, that Ross Greer made. Uh, around how politics is about choices, and Labour's choices will continue to ingrain poverty through continued austerity on public services, yep. uh, but as he said, uh, also on the support for our poorest families. Presiding officer, let me engage directly now uh, with the amendments led by the Tories and Labour today, which are false, hypocritical and do a grave injustice to those working hard in our public services to deliver for the people that we serve. First, the Conservatives. Scotland is not the highest tax part of the UK. This is patent and demonstrable nonsense. The majority of people in Scotland pay less income tax than if they left in, lived in the rest of the UK, and the average Band D council tax bill in Scotland is £700 less here than in England, £600 less in Scotland than in Wales. In Scotland, we have taken uh, action to help mitigate against the UK cost of living crisis presided over by the Conservatives by freezing council tax for two million Scots this year. What we have done on tax presiding officer is use the tax powers available to us to best mitigate UK austerity by raising £1.5 billion more in revenue than if we had done nothing. What, without that, we would have seen cuts to our NHS cuts to local government and other public services, as we have seen elsewhere in the UK, and the Tories should at least be honest about that, yeah. which when I challenged Brian Whittle, he squarely failed uh, to do. Yeah. That is action from this SNP government that I would expect to be opposed by the Tories, who pass on tax breaks for the wealthiest in society whilst cutting public services we all rely on, but shamefully Labour also opposes us raising additional finance for public services. But what I also find curious is that Labour's amendment today would have us delete that we should have high quality public services yeah. and welcomes the key role uh, our workforce plays in delivering those services. And that public sector pay is higher in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. It also deletes the criticism of spending cuts from the Tory spring yeah. statement. Why on earth would they do that? Why would they uh, miss an opportunity to criticise the Tory UK government and their austerity agenda, especially when Wes Streeting defended the challenges faced by the NHS in Wales by saying all roads lead to Westminster? It shouldn't be curious at all, presiding officer, because they are laying the groundwork yeah. for the continued austerity yeah. we have been promised oh, yeah. by a Labour UK yeah. government. £20 billion pounds worth of austerity, according to the Institute for In Fiscal Studies today. In the one area of public service investment we might see coming from Labour that Pam Duncan Glancy referred to in the NHS, Labour has confirmed it will be worth just £134 million pounds for Scotland, barely enough to cover 
a 1 per cent pay rise for the NHS staff, less than most of the, Tory, the recent Tory consequentials. That's not change, that's continued short change, it's continued austerity. And that's why Anna Sauer's claim there would be no more austerity rung so hollow the other night when the First Minister exposed the austerity consensus in the Westminster establishment. Mr Sarwar's read my lips line had about as much credibility as when George Bush used it. It took less than 24 conclude, hours for Keir Starmer to torpedo it because yeah. last night he shamefully admitted there would be continued austerity for families in poverty under Labour as they would not scrap the two-child cap. Presiding officer, the problem for Labour is we know who will be taking the decisions, and they have told us that what they will do, as Michelle Thompson highlighted. The problem for Labour is they can no longer pretend one thing in Scotland, do another at Westminster, and hope the public will not notice. They will continue with austerity, hurting our communities and public services, Must and they will dance Cabinet to the Farage Secretary. tune on immigration, hurting our public services and our economy. That's why, presiding officer, only the SNP will stand to break that austerity consensus. Only the SNP will deliver for public services in Scotland. And why, when we continue to rely on decisions taken at Westminster, only Thank independence you. will deliver the real change Cabinet that the Secretary. people of Scotland are looking for. That concludes, that concludes the debate on Scottish Government priorities investing in Scotland's public services. It's now time to move on to the next item of business and there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that amendment 13602.1 in the name of Liz Smith which seeks to amend motion 13602 in the name of Shona Robison on Scottish Government priorities investing in Scotland's public services be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system. <laughs>